At Northrop Grumman, innovation isn't just an idea. It's a way of life. The value of performance. Northrop Grumman. My name is Blake. I'm an astrophysicist, and it is my job to understand the future. And my name is Scott. I'm an engineer, and it's my job to bring that future to reality. So I'm going to hand over to Blake, let her talk about the science side of the Webb Telescope, and I'm going to come back up here and show you how you build an instrument to get there. Thank you, Scott. Let's see here. What is this a picture of? Does anybody recognize this picture? A couple people's hands are going up. Go ahead and yell it out if you know what it is. He said the Milky Way. That's great. It, we, you know, a lot of us live in cities and live in places where we don't have dark skies. And not everybody gets to see this picture. But as a matter of fact, if it was a really dark, clear night and we went outside, this is basically what we would see from the northern hemisphere looking at the dark sky. And for hundreds of thousands of years, and I'm guessing probably since the time of early humans, when it was dark outside, which it was probably very dark back then, this is basically what people saw. And as a matter of fact, the sky that those early humans saw is probably not very different from the sky that we would see tonight if we look out into the, into the dark. So, of course, it's only very recently that we could leave the Earth and take pictures and look back at ourselves and see what we look like. And I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about a sense of scale, because it's really hard to talk about missions like James Webb Space Telescope, 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope, without first establishing a little bit of what we know about the universe around us. So this should be a pretty f familiar object, our home planet Earth. But I want to just take a second and zoom out a little bit. And now if you look at this solar system box, if you look in the center, we've chosen a coordinate system where we put our own sun at the center and the planets around us, as well as some of the other astronomical objects like the Kuiper Belt. For astronomers, we use a unit of measure that's not totally familiar to a lot of people uh, on Earth because it's not as useful, called a, a light year. And a light year sounds like a measure of time. But uh, as a matter of fact, what we mean by a light year is a distance that's traveled by light or photon in the span of one year. And so how big is that? It's, in astronomy, it's hard to use units because all the units that we use kind of ends up with lots and lots of zeros on the end. But if you can imagine light or a photon traveling 186,000 miles per second. So every second, a photon is traveling 186,000 miles. So if you waited a whole year, that would be the distance that we're talking about. So the sun is about eight light minutes away from the Earth, and those outer objects in the solar system only on the order of maybe a couple of uh, light hours. So what I did here is I'm now just stepping back another step. Remember the last box we looked at was a picture of one dot, one star. Now we're looking at our neighborhood stars. We chose to put the sun here in the middle, but now you can see here's our local neighborhood stars. Now to give you a sense of how much we zoomed out here, I told you it was a couple of light hours from the sun to the outside planets. The closest star here to us, close to that central dot, the closest one is about four light years away. So to get from the middle dot to the next closest dot, it would take a photon four years. If I take that out a bit further, now I'm saying, okay, we talked about our neighborhood stars close together. If we zoom way out and we could look back at our own galaxy, we think we live in a spiral-shaped galaxy. And if you can see those red letters, it says something along the lines of, you are here. And that's approximately where the Earth is in one of the arms of the Milky Way. Now, is this a real picture? No, it's not, because to date, we don't have any spacecraft that have traveled far away enough from where we are to turn back around and look at the Milky Way. So we can't even get far away enough to look at the spiral galaxy of the Milky Way. So what I'm going to show you now are, are simulations based on analytical modeling and gravity uh, cosmology models. So let's pull away from our home galaxy, the Milky Way. You can see it there bright in the center with the red letters. Now this box is showing what we call the local group. Not too exciting of a term, but these are the galaxies in our nearby neighborhood. And you can see lots of little guys clustered around the Milky Way, and those are things that are gravitationally bound or buzzing around like bees in hive around our own galaxy. And then the other big blob is our next nearest neighbor, Andromeda. And the Andromeda galaxy is about 
2.5 million light years away from our galaxy. And as I'm sure you expect, this keeps going. If we step out again, we can look at our Virgo supercluster. You can see that whole local group we looked before is now just a tiny dot in the center of that picture. If we zoom out again, we can see local superclusters, groups of superclusters of galaxies. And zooming out again, you kind of get a box that shows you the extent of the observable universe. And at this time, you're talking about many, many billions of light years across the size of the box. And remembering that each one of these tiny specks on this picture represents groups of galaxies. This is a picture of the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, which is to date the deepest picture that we've taken of the cosmos using the Hubble Space Telescope pushed to the extremes of what it can observe. So what we're doing here is we're taking this box which if you were to put your thumb up on the sky, if you took a scrap of paper about one millimeter by one millimeter and held it up at arm's length, that's be, that would be blocking out the amount of the night sky that's covered in this one image. And as we fly through, we're going back in time looking at the most distant objects. And as you saw, that tiny red dot that flew by is one of the oldest galaxies we've ever been able to take a picture of. And at the end, the question is, is there just blackness beyond that? And that's really what we're doing with the James Webb Space Telescope, is to push beyond the most distant galaxies we've ever observed. Now I wanted to, uh, as I'm wrapping up here, show you something that I think is really neat. Now these are analytic models, so gravity models, where we take little dots and make them behave like galaxies crashing into each other. Now as it pauses, that's a Hubble Space Telescope real picture. So what I'm trying to show you here is that we take our models, balls of dots that we're giving gravitational properties, and we're letting them collide together as they would naturally by gravity. There's the real picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, and now we're back to our simulation. So the point is this is to say we can model these crazy, strange shapes that we see in pictures like the Hubble Deep Field. Now what's striking about these pictures is that, look at these strange shapes. You know, first we wondered, how did the galaxies get into these strange warped Warp shapes, and what you can tell by the that by this analysis is that those are two galaxies crashing together, cannibalizing each other, and it's a rather violent process of two galaxies coming together and ripping each other apart. And we did a pretty good job here, thanks to the folks at the Space Telescope Science Institute and NASA, of doing these analysis and showing how they match up really beautifully with the real pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. But the last thing I want to say before I turn it over to Scott is that. As we look at this picture of gravity taking over in a simulation of large-scale structure form in the universe, these things aren't random. This, the stars aren't randomly distributed here. And here we can see on the biggest scales how we can model these filamentary structures of matter in the universe that, to me, remind me a little bit about structures like veins and arteries in the body. And there is this kind of uh, hierarchical structuring, which is pretty fascinating. But having said all of that, the last thing I'll leave you with before I get off the stage is that beyond this modeling of early galaxies, there's a whole other field about planets. This is a picture taken with Hubble Space Telescope of a dark, cold hydrogen helium cloud. It's very beautiful, but it hides a secret underneath. Here's that same picture in the near infrared taken with Hubble. And notice all the new objects that weren't in there before. By looking inside cold gas with infrared that we have on Webb Space Telescope, we're seeing stars being born. In, cold, in clouds of cold gas. The scientist said, is Hubble is awesome. She just showed you real pictures. We can't look at our own galaxy because we can't travel yet outside of it. So that Hubble telescope on the left in that image is revered. It's a household name. It's in your books, I'm sure, when you're in school. You can hear about it on the news nowadays because there's a new picture being taken about it. It's amazing. A scientist is trying to discover something. Discover something that's already there. An engineer is going to build something that's going to enable them to make that discovery, and usually more discoveries than they ever anticipated. So I'm going to talk about that engineering, now that you're completely inspired and want to come work for us and go build whatever's next. That Hubble on the left has a mirror that's 2.4 meters in diameter. That's a pretty big mirror that collects photons. Not good enough when you want to look 13.5 billion years back in time at light that's really faint. So they want more photons. More photons means bigger mirror. So let me talk a little bit about the instruments and the, and, the, and the mirrors. Let me give you a feeling of the audacity of this engineering. This is a really simple graphic, but if I were to pull this out and show you, it would fill this entire room. 
The length from tip to tail is 80 feet long, the width is 40 feet wide, and the height is 40 feet high. Think of the size of a tennis court. But for those who are starting to learn about rockets, we don't have a rocket that can ever deploy or, or launch something of that size. So we have to build it so that it can fold up, we call it the origami telescope, into a, a size no bigger than what's called a five meter fairing. I already told you the mirrors are six and a half meters across. Well, how do you do that? I'll talk about that a little. We have to build a segmented mirror. We have to build a mirror that folds and then unfolds and then takes a shape that's more precise than if I gave you the job, take the United States and make it as perfectly a flat surface as you could possibly make it. So there's a picture of the sun shield. You see the bottom left there? Those are people. That is 80 feet by 40 feet wide. Those are real sun shield membranes that are gonna block the light from the sun from blinding the optics of the mirror. That umbrella is gonna block that structure on the bottom right, and there's kind of a graphic of it, you know, it's underneath it, which you can see in the top right, and then that structure holds the instruments who are on the left. Those bottom, that bottom picture and that left picture, those are real pictures. And then that's what the mirrors look like. Incredible. Those are polished literally an atom at a time. It took eight years to make the 18 mirror segments. We build all these parts, but then we have to get it to an orbit one million miles away from Earth. One million miles. Does anybody know how far away the moon is from the Earth? Somebody knows it precisely. I would use round numbers, 250,000 miles away. We're going a million miles away. So you see the moon there, Earth in the bottom left. This is a time-lapse video, real time, as it'll take up on the top. On the bottom, there is the, the, the travel versus this distance. There's the moon. We're going to end up all the way on the right part of the screen. We kind of amplified it. So this video, we're going to let run actually in the background. It's not going to distract you too much from all the questions that you have. So this video is going to show a telescope flying into orbit a million miles away from Earth, deploying as it gets there, and then eventually taking science and changing all the textbooks that you're reading now into something else five or ten years from now. It's going to launch in October 2018, and this is an interesting program. It's going to launch from French Guiana, a, a, a spaceport called, um, it's, it's in Karoo in South America. Because of most of the programs we do for um, you know, America launch out of Cape Canaveral, you may have heard of that, Kennedy Space Center is where the shuttle launch out of it. In this case, the European Space Agency donated a rocket called the Ariane 5 rocket. It launches really close to the equator in South America, in French Guiana, and then it launches a million miles away from Earth.